Tonight, uh, we welcome to the podium Leon Creer, who is the inaugural Stern Visiting Professor in Architecture. This new chair is intended to maintain the presence among those teaching advanced studios of architects committed to the continuity of classical and traditional architecture as part of the wider field. Why is your thing flying along here? It's only flying on, your, on this screen. Yes, I'm getting the whole lecture here. Um, the chair is intended, as I said, to maintain the presence among those teaching advanced studios of architects committed to the continuity of classical and traditional architecture as part of the wider field of possibilities in contemporary architecture. In 2008, Robert Rosencrantz, Yale College, 1962, initiated the effort to endow the Stern Visiting Professorship. Others joined him to make the new chair a reality. I am honored by these gifts and by the faith they show in our school and its pluralistic approach. Yale's architecture program, with its roots in the fine arts, has long held that classical and traditional architecture provide fundamental in underpinnings and points of reference to the work of the present, a position that was also held by the pioneering figures of stylistic modernism early in the 20th century, such as Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe in architecture, and Cezanne, Picasso, and Matisse in art. As a result of this new chair, Yale will be able to ensure its historic commitment to the sources of the Western tradition, and in doing so, offer a necessary counterbalance to the explorations ongoing of the avant-garde. I can think of no one more appropriate to inaugurate the Stern Chair than Leon Creer, who has long been a friend of this school. Professor Creer studied architecture at the University of Stuttgart, Stuttgart um, from 1968 to 1974. He worked in close professional collaboration with James Sterling. Since then, he has held faculty appointments at the Architectural Association and Royal College of Arts in London, Princeton University in New Jersey, and the University of Virginia. <laughs> at Yale in 2001, he shared the Aero Saarinen Visiting Professorship in partnership with Andres Juani, and he has held the William B. and Charlotte Depper, uh, Shepherd Davenport visiting professorship on six separate occasions, initially in partnership with Dimitri Porfirios in 1991, then without benefit of partnership in 2002, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. Most recently in 2013, Professor Creer was the Lewis Icahn visiting professor. Professor Creer's contributions to the discipline as a modern architect dedicated to classical and vernacular traditions have earned him a place as one of our most important practitioner theorists, a place that has been repeatedly and widely recognized. He was awarded the Berlin Prize for Architecture in 1977, the jo Thomas Jefferson Memorial Gold Medal in 1985, the Chicago American Institute of Architects Award in 1987, the European Culture Prize in 1995. In, in 2003, he was awarded the Driehaus Prize for Classical and Traditional Architecture, and in 2006, the Athena Medal of the Congress for the New Urbanism. He is the author of numerous articles and books, including Architecture, Choice, or Fate, published in 1997, for which he received the Silver Medal of the Academy Francaise. Please join me in welcoming the inaugural Robert Stern Visiting Professor in Classical and Traditional Architecture, Leon Creer, as he delivers the lecture, <laughs> LC after LC, I have to get the title out, Le Corbusier translated, corrected, and completed, Leo. Touching introduction. 
I hope you won't be too disappointed. <laughs> there is nothing more difficult than to lecture to friends. I'm used to lecture to enemies, but, <laughs> but this is not an easy subject. And particularly as now there are two new books being published of <coughs> by uh, Chalin, uh, another Frenchman, on, on Corbusier's actual involvement with uh, French fascism. And it was true involvement, so. Um, but Corbusier is, an, is a figure which was for me, uh, was my first chosen master. I couldn't work for him because he had died by then. But uh, I had a letter from him which burned in a fire. Uh, <coughs> now, the idea came to me uh, when I saw Stanislaus von Moses's book, Le Corbusier, before Le Corbusier. And it's a subject which we have, which we could pursue with other architects, with Miss Van der Rohe, with Alva Alto. But I have little interest for those people. I have enormous interest for Corbusier, despite you know, my change or my <coughs> um, involvement with traditional architecture. And the reason why I, I was, became so involved was because I grew up in this town, which was absolutely a perfect town, uh, made of medieval and Renaissance and Baroque and uh, military architecture, Belle Epoque architecture. It was a perfect town to grow up in, and I grew up along that, on that uh, boulevard, overlooking the, the town. And of course, when I started to be interested in architecture, uh, I started reading Le Corbusier, and he became really my inspiration and model, and uh, the first projects I did were very much in that spirit. The problem was, or became, started thinking what shall happen if we introduce those ideas to this uh, uh, beautiful city of Luxembourg. And there is, of course, this photograph of Corbusier playing you know, with traditional uh, village-type architecture. So the cause was not completely lost. And uh, there was even a family resemblance. My father uh, looked very much like Le Corbusier, when you see. <laughs> My mother was a pianist like Corbusier's mother, but my mother didn't like Le Corbusier. And uh, except Ronchamp, she really had a strong dislike. My first wife, she hated Le Corbusier. And then the girlfriend I lived with for 16 years didn't like Le Corbusier either. She thought Ronchamp is an architecture of the Strumpf, if you know what that means. It's a sort of caricatural uh, figures who wear funny headwear. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, Stanislaus von Moses' uh, book, Corbusier, and his father, that is me and my brother. We posed. <laughs> you know, when modernists, when they go on holiday, they talk all, all the time of Bernini and, uh, you know, Giordano Bruno and all these, all these characters. When modernists, when classicists go on holiday, they go to see Corbusier. <laughs> And uh, this project was, this is Corbusier's cabane on Cap Martin, and this is my cabane uh, on Mallorca, <laughs> where I did most of this work. The idea is to look at this work again, because uh, 12 years ago, I had this. Oh. <laughs> is it me? Maybe me. Uh, Twelve years ago, I had a studio here with um, Mark Cage um, where we took uh, ten masterpieces of modernism. Barcelona Pavilion, the Villa Stein de Monzy in Garch and so on. And placed them in a very specific context like Williamsburg or uh, uh, New York Brownstone or you know, the Maison de Verre went into Chinatown, and so the students had to study a particular vernacular and translate then these masterpieces, these very well-known and recognized masterpieces, 
into traditional works, maintaining the spirit. It had to be a love story. It should not be a matter of rejection and, uh, and destruction, but really how to translate the qualities which are in these works, and they are present there, how they can be translated into uh, traditional techniques and materials. And I think it was a very interesting exercise. Uh, the most interesting uh, student was actually an, uh, a young Chinese, beautiful, tall Chinese prince, who made such a perfect project that Vincent Scully got mad. He said, what's the point? Because it demonstrated that actually the Maison de Verre could be built in China with Chinese traditional architecture. Every single move could be done uh, with uh, traditional architecture. So there are parts of Le Corbusier which I think are beyond redemption. They are really uh, <laughs> matters of a deranged mind. <laughs> but great artists and geniuses are often deranged. You know? And not everything that the genius does is genial. You know? Particularly when you have absolutely no talent. Corbusier had no talent in urbanism. He had no sense of urbanism at all. Now, the thing was that he had been preceded by brilliant thinkers like Otto Wagner or Ero Sarinen, Elial Sarin, rather, Tony Garnier, Burnham, all these thinkers, town planners, who had actually resolved uh, theoretically the problem of the metropolis. Uh, particularly Sarin, I think Elial Sarin was an, uh, a genius in, in conceiving the modern metropolis as something which is more than just an enlarged small town, but which is a family of of a uh, <coughs> large family of small towns. Uh, Otto Wagner had resolved it uh, theoretically and practically, I think also architecturally. And these were such brilliant statements that there was nothing more to add to the theory of modern, of new urbanism. And Corbusier, had, in order to be heard, had to cry wolf, you know, to really cause scandal in order to be heard. Now, his proposals, his uh, town for three million inhabitants, was not just the town you see, but when you read around the main object, you actually see a banlieue, banlieue résidentielle, a sprawl, what we call sprawl. So it was like an extraordinary vision of a completely radicalized uh, a mass society. And I compare this, you know, you have in the middle the Ville Radieuse on the left, how he applied it to Paris, uh, destroying the right bank, and then on the right, Albert Speer's uh, planning for Berlin. And you see actually that the planning for Speer was rather modest compared to the scale of Le Corbusier, and was mixed use also. Um, now, the, <laughs> apparently, uh, Speer told me that he had the book La Ville Radieuse on the table. Hitler looked and said, unbrauchbar, no, useless, cannot be used. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I know there are serious jokes you're not supposed to laugh about this, but <laughs> I wish I was Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a subject which needs to be looked at from many angles. And what, what Corbusier was a victim of was the belief that the machine was going to dictate human scale and no longer what we are commonly what we know as human scale. But this had, was a process which had already, you know, with the invention of the, the steam engine and the enormous concentration of power which happened through this uh, machinery and new, new energies, coal and, and petrol, that they thought that there would be no more spirit, no more culture, no more nothing, no civilization without the spirit of the machine winning. But that had preceded Corbusier by two or three generations. And you see these extraordinary uh, blowing of scale. This was, would be central Paris, and, or Roman town, or medieval French town. And then 19th century Berlin extensions, which are already an enormous scale, blocks are 300 meters long and so on. No longer made for humans to walk. And then, of course, Corbusier's uh, the, the socialist experiment in Vienna, one kilometer long facade, one architect. Huh? When you lay this over the center of Vienna, you have, uh, I think, 35 blocks designed by 150 architects. Here you have one architect designing one single uh, building. This is Albert Speer and the Corbusier after the war in Saint-Dié. 
So this explosion of scale is something which went beyond, I think, uh, comprehension. Uh, and this extraordinary symbolism of the head, the lungs, the spine, and the legs and feet, industry, culture, residence, and business. And when you compare that, you know, what the way Roman or medieval towns or Renaissance towns were designed, you had an extraordinary richness of sizes of plots, which allowed great diversity of uses and uh, of architecture and vernacular and uh, public and private and religious and, and profane buildings to be from good neighbors and create good urban space. When you have this explosion of scale, where you suddenly had larger and larger plots with uh, more and more uniform uses, there's very little uh, variety for architects to play on, other than pure formal games, because the uses are absolutely uniform. And it is that which Corbusier, in his plan, radicalized, that he said not only this is a fate, but this is something which we must choose, because that is the spirit of our time, c'est l'esprit nouveau. There is no new spirit. Spirit is, you know, transcends, <coughs> I think, novelty. One of the explanations why, why a genius like Le Corbusier was so, uh, uh, I think, affected by a lack of urbanism was the fact that he grew up in this new town of La Chaux de Fonds, which had been burned in late 18th century and reconstructed in a completely rigorous industrial manner, it was an industrial city, where every single house is, or there are no more blocks, but buildings, the blocks are houses, you know, which are often uh, oriented north-south, and there is no urban fabric to speak of, which, where you could really talk of streets and squares and something which would be of a traditional <coughs> fabric. So there are things which I think are beyond uh, being re revisited, they are really bad because, um, you know, the, the northern wall of the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, I don't, I don't think anyone can, uh, can be really excited about it. That's what shocked my mother. <laughs> no. Or this, I think, is complete failure. It's, it's the wrong kind of architecture. It's the wrong kind of idea. Uh, or this kind of plan for, for Algiers. Those are things I think they are beyond, beyond uh, uh, modernity. They, they are just bad architecture, bad urbanism, and I think they should be forgotten. Now, <coughs> the question is how can such a genius, because when you go up on the unité, it's a poetic experience, a lyrical experience, uh, which I think surpasses even the experience of the, uh, going up on the Acropolis. You know, it is really an, a piece of genius. Now Corbusier had time, he took time to mature. He went to Vienna, he was always very ambitious, great writer, great poet. He was refused entry to Josef Hoffmann and to Otto Wagner, and while in Vienna he designed, while in Vienna this happened, in 1904, 1905, he designed this house, Villa Fallet, his first house in La Chaux de Fonds, by correspondence, without facts or email, but it is what one calls zigzag stil because it's very you know, strangely expressionist, very far away from the, the rationalism for which he would become famous. Then <coughs> one can identify several periods in Corbusier's uh, work, uh, several styles. One I call vernacular classical or applies virtually uh, correctly. Uh, one, and this went throughout his, his life, he, he, he built this one, which would be called, uh, so that belongs still to the vernacular, which was very st strongly influenced by Camillo Zitte and Anwin and all these, the Garden City movement. Um, then the nautical style, which became so important in the 1920s, which were forms. He used forms and ideas which were already very familiar in, <coughs> uh, in uh, seaside architecture, in, in the great tra transatlantic liners. And we know of his love of these uh, constructions and his sketches and so on. 
So you find virtually every single idea which he used in that short period uh, had been preceded in, uh, um, in nautical architecture. And then there is a period where he introduces a lot of glass and a lot of steel, steel and glass, sort of industrial materials, profoundly influenced by the Maison Charot. I think Kant Frampton has demonstrated that very well. Uh, and then there is particularly this style of beton brut which came after the war and which I think is profoundly in influenced by Nazi German Albert Speer defense architecture, the Atlantic Wall, of which you see here uh, an example in Bayonne, near Bayonne. Now it's very strange that there is now this revelation that he was also an involved fascist, but as you know, I think that great criminals can be great artists, so I wouldn't hold that against him. Uh, <coughs> but not necessarily do criminals produce criminal architecture, because it's really what this urbanism or what that architecture is worth beyond the regime which they serve. There's also this very extraordinary uh, paint, painterly work of Le Corbusier, which I think has profound roots in Beaux-Arts and classical representation, particularly in the analytic paintings which were so beautifully done under Beaux-Arts regime. And this purist paintings, which I think are, are really extraordinary. Now, he, of course, he had this idea to make a real, to make himself a name, and not only by changing names, but also by saying things which were considered scandalous. And I think it's really not what he said, but the intolerant radicality, which was new, that he claimed that this is the new world, you know, this is the old world, this is bad, this is black, must be ignored. And this is the future, five points. But they are very arbitrary points, five points of architecture you could do with traditional architecture. There's absolutely no problem to have a roof garden or pilotes or strip windows or free, free plan. Uh, I reversed this just as a joke. But <laughs> in fact, I think uh, Bob Stern would agree <laughs> that this is what we are doing and what we are like, what we are liking to do and what we should as architects be better than the industry to do. So I think that is a real modern situation that we, we have to use concrete whether we like it or not, but we can also use uh, different scales. And I think it's worth promoting traditional technique and construction because it's much closer to uh, directly related to human talent, to uh, personal talent, to vocations, where you can actually uh, encourage young people to do jobs which are close to their, you know, which they really feel and which they can express themselves without damaging the rest of the community. Uh, <coughs> so we are now in this situation where that system dominates, whether we do classical or, or traditional buildings or, or modern buildings. It's often only in the, in the last few months that you actually see the difference. Huh? So what happened with Corbusier's obsession was with te technique, high-tech, industrial technology. Not, but he had also this love story with traditional technique, traditional technology, because he used it all through his life with you know, stone walls and brick walls and, and the Catalan vaults and so on. But you see that most of modernism was actually an exaggeration or quoting sources from other fields and by that appearing as novel or new. Now, virtually every form which Corbusier used uh, has been used by the industry before, but he put it in such an association that it creates, has a poetical power, which you don't feel when you're in front of industrial buildings or, or ships. José Aubrey, who is an, the last collaborator of Corbusier, I had him on a jury once, and. Uh, he said, why are you so obsessed with Le Corbusier? I mean, he worked for Corbusier <laughs> all his life. Why didn't you study Miss van der Rohe? No. But I think Miss van der Rohe did some very fine buildings until he became modernist, and then he did the Barcelona Pavilion, which is an absolute masterpiece, and then nothing. No. Absolute void. And can you imagine a greater nightmare than a, a Mies town? All, everything is Mies. I mean, 
first war miss. It's just unbearable. And he was an enormous talent. So we are not talking here about intelligence or talent. We are talking about what are the right or the wrong ideas to apply to architecture. So uh, we, in this course, George and I, we train students to, you know, they have first to draw uh, classical buildings, and then you can see this is famous here, yeah, historical, the early historical society, and then modify them. You know, once they are programmed, they have to modify them, play around with them, variate variation. When you, uh, you can now hear on internet, you can hear uh, Rachmaninoff piano concerto number five. Rachmaninoff wrote four piano concertos. But now there's a man called Alex, is Alex Wallenberg, I think, and he used the second symphony of uh, Rachmaninoff, added the piano, and it's a fifth piano concerto. It's fantastic. It's as good as the other ones. Uh, so I think you know, these people, once these genius discover new territory, it's just like discovering a landscape which nobody had seen and then painting it. But in that landscape, you can move, paint another facet, write the 12th Symphony of Brahms. Why not? You know, it's, it's really like landscape. It's a language once it's established, once it's studied, and talent comes together, uh, you, you, you get these new creations which are extraordinary and which had never been there and uh, ineffable. So it's really a systematic approach to see also uh, to counter the movement. Now Corbusier is a genius. He's being fitted around the world with enormous exhibition and uh, people are supposed to take it all, you know, good or bad. It's supposed to be a genius. Now, uh, I think he had something extraordinary and I tried to find out what it is. And for instance, he exercised, he did very few classical buildings in this Villa Schwab. Villa Turk in La Chaux-de-Fonds was one of his, let's say, buildings, most conventional buildings in a, in a traditional style. And I think it's a very interesting plan. It's a very interesting composition, but it's full of really lourdeur. Huh? I mean, this is really, I think, not very well mastered. The master wouldn't do that sort of thing. And also, this is a house, but it has like a screen, like a cinema or what. And then, very strangely, the masters enter here and the servants enter there. Weird. Why would one do that, a house like that? <laughs> and then you get lost in, 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 in weird situations. And then, but, you know, and this is, for instance, <laughs> an idea. You enter in a decent way you, in the courtyard and then resolve the plan, composition. This light over the stack is going right the way through uh, this grand plan. It's a very good plan. And you make a real fine building out of it. Huh? <laughs> this cob is not translate, but correct it. <laughs> and I'm sure we could have convinced him. No. It's better. <laughs> Just evident. <laughs> uh, don't need to be a genius. To, it has very interesting parts, but also very weak parts. And I think it's very important that in face of these geniuses to, to stay critical. Uh, this is how you enter. That's his plan. You enter and you have this strange, and then you turn around. And, uh, and this is where the servants enter and you meet in the stairs. <laughs> it's embarrassing. So this is a corrected plan. It's uh, much more systematic and so on. And I think it would be an interesting restoration to do. <laughs> uh, he, Corbusier, talked a lot about proportion. And um, I think he, he got some ideas right, which were came, came from Tirsch. You know, Tirsch was a German architect <coughs> who had written the theory of, of proportion, which was published in the Handbuch der Architektur, 51 odd volumes very systematic, and he used some of these, which were actually what counts, i come to that later, is really the main divisions in, in an, uh, it's the main divisions in a mass of, or, of openings or masses which count, the rest doesn't, doesn't really matter the angle, it's a matter to coordinate openings and, and volumes. 
in a systematic way. Uh, I'll come back to that. Here was his very interesting little discovery. I have these magazines called Il Villino Italiano. And there was a dottore, professore, Michike, or something like that from Turin, who did a very similar building. And he had actually resolved the problem here. And I couldn't, I looked everywhere. I have about 10 volumes, but there's nowhere a date. It's difficult to see who copied whom, but <laughs> it's actually an interesting research for the Corbusier Foundation. For instance, you lie in a bed here, the masters lie in a bed looking at the wall. <laughs> Behind this, uh, what is it, for the pigeons. And then, <clears throat> in a way, you have a beautiful landscape, and you could open it. Here you, this is this embarrassing part. Here you would enter into a courtyard and turn around and, and so on. Step out of your car. He uses a lot of trellis. Here the whole penthouse would be trellised. And you would have windows all around for the bed. Here the, ba no, the bed has this, looks against that wall. And then, if you are lucky, you see the landscape no, sideways. The bathroom has these enormous windows. <laughs> it's in weird. I mean, it's not masked. So this is where, where it comes. I think that is what really, this is the lesson of Tirsch, huh? that the main volumes and the main openings uh, are harmonized by the same diagonal. Whatever the proportion is. But as long as you systematize, the, you, you relate the openings and the, the volumes, the solids and the voids, you will have a harmony which is quite powerful. Uh, things go really bad when you have this kind of, <coughs> now, he, he talked a lot about this, and I think in Verne Architecture he has this drawing, which is absolutely correct, relating the major, you know, this, this is not actually from Verne Architecture, but it's more correct than Verne Architecture, uh, where the major pavilions are related. Uh, whereas in the Villa uh, La roche en the diagonals go anywhere, have a, at, regularly nothing at all. There are, I don't know, like 12 different types of window openings and proportions. And there are actually some vertical openings, which he condemned in his drawing, you know, with, in his promotion of the horizontal window, as something which was no longer modern. So it's this extraordinary talent, genius, but doing things which are really weird. Now, the proportions, for instance, of the Villa Stein, <coughs> de Monzy, has some interesting proportions, but they don't really work. I mean, that is the golden section here, but the rest is, is not related. So he has all these lines going everywhere, and, and yet it's a formidable building. When you stand in front, you are really arrested by the grandiosity of this building. So I systematically studied the proportions of the, of the windows. What is so important about the windows? No. This is the Villa Fischer. The, there is not one single pane which is the same width. And so you stand in front of this building and you get the shock, you don't know exactly why, but <laughs> there's something happening there which is... Uh, now, this is a correction in the modernist style, because he had this very beautiful, delicate building for his enfant, who was, I think, the main influence on Corbusier's paintings, and probably also his change of attitude, where he became uh, a modernist uh, in painting and also in architecture. And then it led to a rift, I think, later, probably personal. But it is this very beautifully proportioned building and then this odd zigzag again, which probably leaked, and that's probably why it was changed and is now flat roof above it. But also here, for instance, these are squares or double squares, but when you turn around on the other side, they are not the same proportion. This is an inscribed equilateral triangle, and this is an, a proper square. 
this creates this strange uh, perspectival distortions when you look at it. Uh, I'm going to publish this as a book as an apocryphal volume number nine of the oeuvre complete, imitating because he was he was a genius, uh, particularly also in the laying out of books. His books are the particularly the oeuvre complete. Uh, is a system I imitated when I did the first volume of Jim Sterling's work. It's a scenographic, it's a scenographic telling of a story, how you go through a building and you see everything, the whole, the, the part, and how the part relates to the whole, and the bird's eye view, and, uh, and so on. And it's a very, very interesting technique. I use this, uh, so that's a immeuble villa here translated, adopting the same cell, no, he's, is there a way of going back here? Yeah. On the right? I'm on the left. Were you using that? Ah, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So there's this, uh, no, the L-shaped cell, which came from the chart house of Elsa, as he claims, and then stacked vertically uh, into six-story high blocks uh, purely for residential use. And, but the way, it is a good example, for instance, you see a part of the cell which was built for the 1925 exhibition of the Art Deco in Paris, montaged in this uh, photograph, you see the plan and then the ensemble. And so it is a rather traditional building block, but it would have ghastly effects on this side of the street. Can you imagine these blank walls? It's just uh, already was one of the problems he had uh, also in later buildings. Uh, this translated into, with traditional techniques, that you have the same cell, you know, the L-shaped cell, with the garden, and you stack them, and you can build them in traditional architecture, you add shops on the ground floor offices, and it becomes real urban building, in the same style, you know, but in a more modest scale, and <coughs> probably better uh, surviving the weathering of our climates. Uh, that was the Esprit Nouveau Pavilion, and that's how it's translated. No. Same spirit, same proportions, same space, same esprit. No. What's wrong? <laughs> Why did you need an Esprit Nouveau? Uh, this is uh, the same cell used for a much more modest uh, block of three stories, and a commercial ground floor, and then these villas on top with parking courtyard, and then making an urban quarter. And now applied in the same style to make, you know, like a nice urban quarter. There's something you find actually very good modernist architecture, much better than Paris or Vienna or anywhere, in Bucharest, in uh, there are these very small villages done with beautiful modernist architecture, incredibly well built, and still surviving now because they have not been uh, modified. And now we come to this interesting problem. What do we do as modernists if we have to restore a historic building? No. Because if you do that, if you do this, that is a reaction. That's reactionary. That is conservative restoration, yet that is what Tokomomo demands of uh, architects to do, which is contradiction of the Charter of Venice. The Charter of Venice demands if you restore a historic monument, you have to show in material, in proportion, in color, in character, in technology, that you build of our time and that you mark this building in such a way that it cannot be misunderstood for a previous period. It's a formula for rape, and that's what many architects now do, unfortunately. But it's so funny that they give a special allowance for, for this kind of buildings. <coughs> this is a painting by Karl Lobin, his friend painter, who does often paintings of classical, classical architects uh, now. And uh, this is the project for Le Nouveau Pessac. Pessac is the Quartier Henri Fruges outside Bordeaux, which was Corbusier's first major urban project which was built, and I think also to this day his most successful one. 
It is also, on the other hand, was very uninnovative in the uh, urban sense. It was just a loop road with a cul-de-sac, repetitive building types, the, the Graziel, the zigzag, the isolé, the, and what he condemned himself in Verne Architecture, l'illusion des plans, he describes very uh, precisely how he condemns the illusion of symmetry when it is not perceptible from a normal observation. You, know, you have this axis of symmetry which is absolutely meaningless when you walk in the street. You absolutely you see nothing of the symmetry. You only see it it's for bird's eye. So it's a mechanical symmetry which is in a way meaningless and wasted, wasted on uh, vernacular. But the house types are extraordinarily attractive. There have been, many of these houses have been terribly uh, violated and uh, Philippe Boudon wrote a book about this, you know, that and Corbusier is supposed to have said la, la vie gagne um, and because they had been so degraded. Uh, but they are in fact so beautiful that they are now being restored by people who live there and there's a fan club of Pesac who, who restore beautifully those buildings and it's very well worth looking at this. What, what I think is a little weak is urbanism. It's exactly this, it's just very conventional loop with a cul-de-sac and then the buildings are just lined up. Uh, traditional urbanism would look at the whole picture. How does, does this fit into a much larger urban organism uh, plan, edge roads, you know, continuations, networking to the neighboring communities, have squares for use which are non-residential and have much more interesting streetscape, but in this case using Corbusier's building types because they are so interesting. Then you see the building lots, Corbusier's building lots, and these are the revised building lots. So I think, I mean, we won't redo this one, but one could actually do a new uh, quarter like that very successfully. This is the Corbusier situation with the building types, uh, seven or eight building types existing. And then I add a market, a circle, a mairie de quartier, and a church of some sort, and they are situated then on squares which form the major on the major axis. And it becomes a place. It's no longer a suburb, it's no longer a residential quarter. It becomes a real urban place, a town. Uh, the church here would be, is still in the Corbusier style, lit by a uh, huge skylight with indirect light. And that wall would be painted by this great painter, I forget his name. He's the most famous painter there in Dakiten. <coughs> and so on. And this is translation into a traditional Dakiten style. Here you see the Graziel translated into conventional. They say when you go to Whole Foods, it says organic or conventional. <laughs> this would be. So the same thing, but you have the stack is under, under the overhang of the roof, otherwise it's rotting away. And also, a roof garden is completely useless when you don't have a room out there. It's just for you know, breathing, but it's not for living. And I add a room up there, so it really becomes much more interesting. And the club and so on. And that's the translation into conventional style is not yet right. Uh, here, famous uh, Villa Stein de Monzy, with my preferred car. <laughs> it's actually standing outside. I think it's the best piece of design of the 20th century. Uh, that was a sketch from uh, the, the 2003 uh, exile, which we did with Mark Cage. And here is this extraordinary uh, you know, it was the main subject of Colin Rowe's essay on transparency, number two. And here you have, when you look at Corbusier's plan, which is very impressive, the, the building, but there are strange things, like you have the a little double space and then the stair which goes up without 
at the main room, which has no relation to the main room, which is this extraordinary double height terrace, but you can't actually see into it. Uh, so this is corrected here. No. And uh, you open that to the main room and you have, instead of having the flat ceiling, you have it. It actually looks very much like uh, some of Mendelssohn's, but uh, this could be done actually in stone, you know? stone lintels and piers. Dimensionally, it corresponds exactly to the building, and the difference between front and back, you have this swelling out here. Uh, and that accounts for the, there is a module which is rigorously applied. That's as is for Madame Stein, and that's <coughs> probably much cheaper to maintain than that is the importance of opening this up to the main bedroom or the, the living room so weird to have the main room there and you can't get out yeah. uh, and this becomes much grander Uh, this is the villas in, in Weissenhof, designed a lot by Alfred Roth, I think, from what we hear. And this is translated again into traditional uh, building construction. Again, also here, you have the, you know, the roof gun. This, he has this obsession with having a single orientation in a main room, whereas the interest of a corner of a corner is to have windows on, in two directions. I mean, that's a real luxury. Or you have this, this poor bedroom which only looks out there and has absolutely no opening to the, to the terrace, which I think is, is really a mistake. I mean, you wouldn't let the student do that. Huh? So he's corrected. And there are variations, regional variations of it. Uh, now, the most, his most perfect creation, which I, I might disagree with our dean, who doesn't like the <laughs> Villa Savoie. I think I adore it. I find it's absolutely... It's such a beautiful building that you want to put a roof over it to protect it against... Because <laughs> it's so fragile. It's so delicate. It's absolutely marvelous. But it's not made for this climate. Uh, so it is now placed here. This is from Book of Quetla. It's placed here and it's like lost. Whereas here is a ledge, a landscape ledge. He could have moved it onto this ledge, you would have approached it by this Cornish road and then driven under opening the view towards the Seine and uh, Poissy. And here a quick sketch as you would arrive and then put your car in there and there's the Jardin Potager, which is close to the kitchen. So what is it? <laughs> what is the problem with Corbusier? This is what defined traditional architecture, climate, soil, altitude. And here, because of you know, machinery and, and fossil fuel, you can ignore climate, but I think not for long. Uh, here is um, the Villa Era Zuris, which was designed for Chile. But there are these beautiful drawings, which are virtually 100% vernacular. Uh, there was a Japanese architect who worked for him at the time. Bob, I forgot the... Mike, Mike Eva. Mike Eva. Mayakawa. Mayakawa. Mayakawa worked for Corbusier, probably on this building. He went to Japan, back to Japan, worked for Antonin Raymond, and Antonin Raymond built this. And Corbusier is virtually inside. He published in his second volume of Oeuvre Complete, saying, pas la peine de se gêner. No, no worry to... No. To, to be embarrassed. <laughs> Straight copy. So here translated into traditional uh, fabric. Because there was this strange butterfly roof which he used again and again and, and which obviously is, is very bad for uh, rain. Now the famous Armée du Salut. Um, <laughs> my preferred car. <laughs> A slight Wagnerian style here. 
Uh, this was Corbusier's master plan for the area. Uh, this army de salut, and he planned these very large blocks. And here, what happened now, disgusting buildings, you know, absolutely shocking in disgust. And it's an institute for ancient languages. Can you believe these poor people in these horrendous buildings? <laughs> the Armée du Salut in this terrible state is now being restored, but they could have you know, used this to make, to integrate into more delicate fabric. And another interesting uh, thing is you know, between 1937 37 and 1945, the Germans, Ernst Neufert, who worked on the Albert Speer, did several books which were, became major uh, bestsellers for architects after the war, and in which there's a very elaborate theory of proportion, actually elaborated by uh, von Neufert by uh, Mr. Debus, who was my professor at brief, during my brief stay at Stuttgart University, and he didn't want to talk about it. But you find virtually all Corbusier's diagrams for the modular, you find in these books from 1938 onwards, done under the auspices of the uh, German government <coughs> and Albert Speer. Now, here is the uh, proof of the pudding. Now, these are the, the Nazi buildings on Guernsey and uh, on the French coast. And it is these buildings which, without any doubt, influenced the Corbusier's post-war style. I mean, they are direct, direct uh, references to it. This is the building which is the, the garbage collection pavilion next to the Unité in Marseille. I mean, it looks like, exactly like that. Yeah. But I recommend any visit uh, of this. It's an extraordinary feeling to be up there. Uh, I was always intrigued by the capital in Schandiga, and I'm still looking for a client to build a capital city. No, it's, they don't come <laughs> forward easily. But I went there and I ch completely changed my mind about it because uh, when I taught at the EA, I had a student, um, a free student to uh, Rodrigo de Arce, who is now teaching in Chile. And I gave him this plan to urbanize because I said, this is an ideal town. The plan uh, contains the genes for an ideal town and just use these as building blocks, which he did. And, uh, which we published, and it was a very nice exercise, but I think <coughs> it was not the right idea, because in fact, when you go there, the quality of the spaces between, despite the terrible state of the, of the buildings, is very powerful and, uh, and unique, and I think it's, it's something which should be preserved. Now, uh, he, for the center, for zone 15, or zone 17, I think it's the center, of, uh, Shandiga, he designed this module, a very large module, in order to, for people to build in shops and houses, and, uh, and it looks absolutely, I mean, un bordel, as they say in France. Uh, and that is really where the problem lies, that Corbusier was a vernacular architect. He was not a classical architect. He developed modern architecture into monumental vernacular, because there's no artistic elaboration. The artistic elaboration goes into painting, into enamel doors, into sculptures, but the architecture itself is almost undiluted vernacular, concrete vernacular. And of course, when that is taken over, as in this case, as he uh, had actually foreseen in his Abu project for, for Algiers, had strangely foreseen what happened here, you know, this kind of incredible. <coughs> Uh, vulgarity, which suddenly takes, <laughs> takes over. Now, another uh, part of this project could be, and I think uh, Stanislas is going to work at this, to assemble all the architects who worked in that style, who recognized Corbusier as a stylistic master, and tried to work in that style. And I think there are some very good examples, uh, like Giannola or Siriani in France or... Um, I think he's actually the best, he's a student of Syriani, and he worked briefly for <coughs> Richard Meyer. And of course, Michael Graves' uh, Snellman House and so on. And there were, I think, with these people and with that style and with uh, a low fabric, one could actually build a very attractive town. And I think it would be a formidable book to find all these people and get them together. 
because it is really a beginning of a language. It's not very elaborate, but I think it should be developed. And this is coming back to Shandiga. This is really the poetry of Shandiga, is these enormous spaces which are really a recollection or a quotation of the poetics of airfields. This is incredible, uh, beautiful atmosphere when you're on an airfield with these huge hangars and beautiful air airplanes. And I think it is that which he was after. But what is missing is the fabric, because the capital is outside the city. Nobody knows. When you ask in Zone 17, where's the capital? Nobody knows where it is. You show them a photograph of the, of the assembly building, they don't know where it is. No, it's, it's extraordinary. The building, the capital building in Shandiga has no presence, no civic presence. But this would be the solution. You know. Let's say these are traditional neighborhoods, quarters, quartier. And you ha can have very large spaces in between and then have these monumental buildings attached to, you know, this could be the justice, this could be the governor's palace, this is the, the parliament, linked to a fabric. So you have between these vast park spaces or paved spaces, which could be actually very interesting. But on their own, they are a bit lost out there, facing the, facing the Himalaya, as you like to see. Now, with the students this year, we have done an, a brief and extremely interesting exercise, which is to take the secretariat, which is like a musical uh, score. I mean, it's so full of themes and variations and sub-themes and shifting and uh, uh, recollections and reversals and, and crab walk and so on, that we took this apart and made an avenue out of it. And this is a brief vision. This was a two-day exercise. Huh? Uh, of this Avenue du Secretariat, taking, using only the architecture of the Secretariat and collaging <laughs> it in such a way that we can... So actually Corbusier could become an urban architect, a new urban architect, a real you know, modern new urban architect. Uh, these are more revisionist uh, interpretations of the... Actually, I use here this fantastic thesis of Alex Gorlin, who did this beautiful uh, thesis on the governor's palace, which I think is one of the most powerful buildings ever designed and which should be built somewhere. Bob, we have to build it somewhere. No. <laughs> Full scale. On the beach. Well, it's, the problem is it's the Villa Savoie on, you know, <laughs> again. And so on, there are themes and variations which I constantly have in my own uh, projects. Uh, this is like a vision of a different <coughs> champ, Autre Champ d'Igare. And this is an, uh, a painting by Professor Gorski in uh, Notre Dame, done in the style of the Daniel brothers, who were famous illustrators of the early 19th century in, uh, in India, and so on. So themes and themes, and they recur. And finally, when you do this exercise, you actually find that most of his themes, uh, you know, the tall porches or the, the arcades, the shutters, the, the monumentalized shutters, they are themes which were or have been exercised in, in traditional architecture. Uh, this is the last project, which is the church in Fermini, which has been finished by uh, José Aubry. Uh, Corbusier. Uh, who had the, the been disengaged fascist, uh, his most important, three most important friends were important in the French fascist movement, uh, worked for Vichy for uh, three years. And then after the war, immediately after the war, he is employed by uh, Eugène Claudius Petit to build the unité, who was the minister of reconstruction, to build the unité in Marseille. He was an important person in the, in the resistance. And he became mayor of Firmini, and he created this Firmini there, which is green Firmini against the dank and dark stone Firmini. And uh, Corbusier then had the job to design uh, this campus made of uh, Maison du Peuple, a church, a piscine, and a stadium. And they are, the urbanism, again, is very poor. Well, what I propose to the church is very, very interesting, very powerful and very beautifully built and actually executed. And 
that proposes to complete the Firmini de Pierre along this boulevard, which will be the separation between Virmini de Pierre and Virmini Vert, and integrate this church with the uh, Vozhensky finished this, and the existing buildings into the complete uh, uh, traditional fabric. This is done in the Corbusier style, you know, before and after, in the urban square. Uh, I improvise here, my, I'm a bit rusty in this style, but and this is translated into <laughs> traditional style. So we live in democracy, so there should be choice. You know. uh, as you see, this is in my old project in 1976. I won these competitions in, in Paris for La Villette, which was the Villa Savoie on stilts and so on. Also there. And particularly, oh no, there's more, sorry. Uh, yes, this is the uh, correction of the uh, Ministerio de Educación and what is Salud. <laughs> you all know it. Now, why would I do that? Because Corbusier uh, didn't do it. Uh, he, he didn't get the job, but he claimed the building. And um, I think that building would have been much better reduced to three floors. It has this very grand, there the pilotes have really very powerful uh, poetic and, and practical uh, purpose. And I send this to Stanislaus and, and he says, why do you do this? Because this looks now like a suburban shopping mall. And then I send him this, where every single building around would have the same height. Then he said, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Because Corbusier is better in three stories. <laughs> Anybody is better when you have low fabric. Very few people are able to do really tall, tall buildings, and um, particularly tall utilitarian buildings. And this would have been the right way to do it, to relate to the church, have a series of nice squares and so on. Uh, a village he built for La Sainte-Baume near uh, in the Provence, which has very almost vernacular architecture, mm -hmm. built in, in earth. In, uh, and I just made this more interesting following the topographic situation. And this is the last one. This is Ronchamp sur mer. Uh, corrected, not translated, but corrected because there's something really schtroumpf about this. <laughs> weird. And, and also, the great moment in this church is this, you know, what he learned from the Villa Adriana. This light streaming in from the tower and making this absolute, if you want to have a sacred space experience, that's it. But the main altar is embarrassing because you get the sparkling lights don't, don't work. Um, and this was using that idea you know, to have the main altar there and just have this high chapel here. Let me make this grand because this is a spectacular theatrical space to be under here. To have. I think that's it, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. A challenging uh, view of architectural history of the 20th century. Um, I'm sure there must be one or two questions or a polemic bursting out of the audience at this point. Professor Vidler, are you looking about ready to say something? <laughs> that was French. <laughs> Other, other? Yes, sir. Wait a minute, we'll get you a microphone. Hey, Leon, I have a question for you. Uh, any proposal for the Paul Rudolf building then? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He <laughs> gave me designs for the R Rudolf building and the addition. I have them in my office upstairs. <laughs> we will have them in a show next spring. That's we will perfect. get to see them. Thank you. The main one was to demolish it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. It's harder to illustrate that. <laughs>
Other questions or observations? Yes, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, who, uh, who gets most angry at your proposals and in your experience, and, and what is the role of, of humor in, in, in the way you approach No, there's this. no humor in this. It's dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> I started my life as modernist, and I will end as, as a problem. <laughs> but no, I showed this as Notre Dame, uh, and the, the wife of Thomas Gordon Smith, she was really angry. She, she left the audience, bang, got off. And Thomas Gordon Smith was a marvelous man, but you know, he created this classical curriculum at Notre Dame, but... Notre Dame, in English it's Notre, Notre Dame. Notre Dame, <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but he got very angry, he said, this is irrelevant for... So I said, but have you been to Bonchamp? It's irrelevant for the Catholic faith. So, so he reminded me of, did you see Babette's feast? Yes. Yeah, when the, uh, finally they find out they are going to, yes, they accept the dinner, and then somebody says, but what if we like it? And the elderman says, we won't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Who's next? Yeah. I think this is my tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the subject of a book. Alan, you're going to uh, wait a minute. I, I, I will tell an anecdote that I think is true, but uh, one's memory fades. I think one of the first times you visited Yale, um, uh, we walked around together, and um, you hadn't been uh, since Lucan's uh, British Art Center was finished. And as we were walking down the other side of the street, you pointed to it and said, is that Lucan's British Art Center, and I said, yes, it's a wonderful building, but it's best inside, let's go. And you said, no, it looks very much like I expected. <laughs> so I think your, your next, your next uh, that's what I said, what's next, maybe you need to work on some of those buildings. Oh, we did that one year studio. Yeah. You did redo this. It's all been done. Professor in 1992 or so, and there was like a revolt of students that didn't want to touch it. But then 10 years later, we had it, and it worked very well. We demolished this, the, the Tucan buildings, and the church, and did a whole new forum. It was a marvelous project. I think, I think demolition is the easy way out. What? Demolition is perhaps the easy way yes, out. Yes. Tabla rasa. <laughs> Are there other questions or observations? If not, we thank our speaker and we'll join him in the second floor, on the, on the second floor in the gallery for a reception. <laughs> <laughs>